Good morning, everyone, and welcome to St. John's for another session of virtual worship. This session is for March 29th, the fifth Sunday of Lent. So let's take a moment to prepare our hearts and minds before God as we worship him this morning. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who gathers us from the wilderness to redeem us and to make us new. Amen. Gathered in the name of Jesus, let us now take a moment to turn our hearts toward God in humble confession. God of all grace, we confess that we have wandered and have often lost our way. Do not remember the deeds of our past, but help us to turn our faces toward the future where your forgiveness is sure and where your love overflows. Amen. God embraces you in tender care and feeds you with surprising mercy. Like a loving parent, God runs to meet you again this day, forgiving your sins for the sake of Jesus Christ and giving you life anew. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, your Son came into the world to free us from all sin and death. Breathe upon us the power of your Spirit, that we may be raised to new life in Christ and serve you in righteousness in all of our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading for today is from Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley, and it was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you. and You shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The gospel for today is John chapter 11, verses 1 through 45. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus. Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death, 
Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he'll be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you might believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Mary and Martha to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. So they followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep over there. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and all the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he's been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. So, I, I used to think the images in Ezekiel were just bizarre and, and weird and unrelatable, almost silly, but um, they're not. They're really quite awful. 
Imagine in Ezekiel's day the kind of slaughter fest that went on during war. It was common practice for a conquering army to sweep through and, and leave the thousands of defeated enemy soldiers dead right there on the battlefield. It was like just one last shot at humiliating the losers, you know. That's the kind of field that Ezekiel is referring to in his vision. A literal pile of bodies, humiliated, abandoned, dead, and hopeless. A whole civilization lost. Still, that image, it, it, it seems foreign to me. So I'm thinking of other valleys of, of dry bones, like the battlefields of the Re Revolutionary War. 651,000 casualties. The Civil War, 620,000 deaths. It's mind-bending. Even that's hard to conceive of. Um, maybe back to Earth, the Vietnam War, 58,220 Americans alone killed in, that, in, that, in those battles. That's a lot of dry bones. That's a lot of valleys of hopelessness and despair. Here's another valley of dry bones for a modern day Ezekiel to look on. Um, 67,000 deaths per year due to opioid addiction. And that's just one valley in today's world. And yet, that's more casualties than the whole Vietnam War every year. And where will we be when this coronavirus has run its course? The point of this, all this hyperbolic Old Testament imagery is, is that Ezekiel could see similar things to what we can see right now, places of utter desolation and despair and abandonment and hopelessness. And then the gospel shows us another kind of valley, except um, it's only one set of dry bones. It may not be a whole nation or a whole city, but it is a whole family a whole community that's grieving this loss, that's experiencing this hopelessness, that even with Jesus as their best friend, Lazarus was beyond intervention, and they are all feeling abandoned by God. So there in the Old Testament reading, Ezekiel stands feeling similarly abandoned, surveying the carnage of a war long lost, and the gospel crowd stands, surveying the tomb of a friend long lost. And we stand outside the doors of nursing homes and emergency rooms, surveying the damage being done by a virus that's more aggressive than anything we know right now. And right there is where we really have no option but to, to grapple with our definition and our own expectation of God. I don't know, maybe this group of texts about, about death and desolation and valleys and abandonment and hopelessness and almighty power seemingly not used, maybe all this is reaching the pinnacle of our Lenten journey in the fifth week. Because maybe now we can begin to understand that, that all of this discipleship stuff all of this study, all, all of this worship, all this hard work doesn't eliminate the valleys of dry bones in our world. And yet, that's what we need to figure out about our Lent, about our faith, about our salvation, about our God. None of this is something we can do. This is something only God can do. We can only do so much. We can't force everyone to maintain peace and stability. We can't force everyone to stay home. We can't make everyone agree. We can't control other people's choices. And that's primarily why we can never eliminate evil. And, and, and we can't eliminate death. But that's only half the story. So the first half is when God asks Ezekiel, what do you see? And Ezekiel says, essentially, 
I see that the world sucks. The same way that the crowd in the gospel tomb only saw and smelled death. But here's the other half. Out of the deadest, most defeated, most abandoned losers of all, out of complete and utter desolation, God can breathe life. Out of the smelly four days decomposed beyond dead corpse of the crowd's friend Lazarus, Jesus does renew life. The awesome, fearful, incomprehensible power of God. See, it's, it's, it's not there just for our convenience or to help us from getting the coronavirus or to keep our refrigerators full in the meantime. The awesome, fearful, incomprehensible power of God it's there to literally drag you out of death into life, to literally resurrect you when you literally die, and to spiritually resurrect you when you think you're empty and hopeless and your soul is in agony and you are done and you think you have lost. You think you are alone and withered and useless. Thing is, there is no such word as vanquished in God's vocabulary. The worst massacre of dry bones, the worst possible scenario of a world gone to pot or to virus, or a society gone, as we say, to hell in a handbasket, all of that is just a temporary glitch to God. And that's what Jesus is saying when he commands the people to, to unbind Lazarus and, and let him go. That's what God is saying to Ezekiel when he breathes life into that valley. He's unbinding even the most hopeless situation and giving it another chance. When we have become bound up in our own valley of expectation, when we have become bound up in our fear of what might be to come if we go outside, when we are hopelessly lost in, in the recognition of our, our own imperfection and our own inadequacy, when we are at the point where we finally realize that we can no longer fix it, the thing is, we still have God, and God is not done. God is never done. So as we face these uncertain, stinky days and weeks to come, look back at God's work in today's text, and remember, when we are done, God is just getting started. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. So let's take a minute to pray for each other about all these things and for the church and the world and for anyone who is in any kind of need. God of life, bind your faithful people into one body, enliven the church with your spirit and bless the work of all those who work for its renewal. Accomplish your work of salvation in us and through us for the sake of the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of life, you love the world that you have made and you grieve when creation suffers. Restore polluted lands and waterways. Heal areas of the world ravaged by storms and floods and wildfires, droughts, and other natural disasters, especially the coronavirus. Bring all things to new life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of life, you weep with those who grieve. Unbind all who are held captive by anxiety, despair, or pain, or illness especially those whose names we lift up to you right now in our homes. Fill us with compassion and empathy for all those who struggle and keep us all faithful in prayer. Lord, in your mercy, we hear our prayer. God of life, we give thanks for the opportunities that this congregation still has to connect with our community and caring for our needs in any way that we can. 
Strengthen our ties with each other in this troubled time. Help us to find new ways to reach out in love and care for our neighbor. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of life, you are our resurrection. And we remember all those who have died and trust that in you they will live again. Breathe new life into our dry bones that we too might live with you forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. According to your steadfast love, O God, hear these and all of our prayers as we commend them all to you through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. And may the peace of God be with you always. And take a moment to share that peace with each other or air that peace with each other as best you can from six feet away. And now, one more prayer before I leave you for today. Life-giving God, in the mystery of Christ's resurrection, you did send light to conquer all darkness, and you sent bread of heaven to nourish all your people. Send us forth this day with the healing power of the gift of faith, that we may serve you more fully by loving our neighbors more deeply. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon each one of you with favor and grant you peace. So go in that peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you for joining me this morning, and I hope you have a, a peaceful and stable day.